These are critical, absolutely critical to your understanding and manipulation uh, for organic chemistry. So it's all about the balance between your forces and your bonds and what you can do with them. I want to reiterate this again because it shows up everywhere, both in your textbook and online answers, if you have, particularly for the lab, if you go online, oh, why is hexane not soluble in water? Right? They answer, oh, hexane is nonpolar and water is polar. Well, what is polar? So usually the response I get of dead science, I have no idea what polar is. Okay, well, what's nonpolar? I don't know what that is either. Okay, well, if you don't know the terms that you're using to provide the answer, it's probably not a good idea to use those terms. And more often than not, the terms polar and nonpolar get horribly either misused or, depending on how someone is using it, they're changing the definition. So you have to be very careful with applying those and where those terms are coming from. Okay? Uh, I'm intimately aware of this because my un or master's degree was working with a liquid uh, and look at, looked at how it affect other affected other molecules. And so if I looked at one reference on this liquid, they said, oh, it's wickedly polar. It's the most polar thing you could possibly have. I look at another reference, same repu or reputable sources for both of these, and that same or that other reference for the same compound would say it's nonpolar. Okay. The two extremes that you could run, and you get two extremely different answers. Okay. So you have to be careful on how these terms are defined. The definition that's going to be most useful for organic chemistry is not looking at Debye's or polarity, but looking at similarity of forces. So that means if you look at a compound with a polar covalent bond and you see that it has dipole-dipole forces, you can now compare, can compare those dipole-dipole forces to another molecule. Right? So you look at the forces, not this nebulous term of, oh, it's polar or nonpolar. Right? So just kind of remember that when looking at these things. So when we looked at phase changes, we talked about looking at that top example. So to give you guys a little bit more practice, I want you to go through and take a look at this bottom practice, bottom section, and I want you to go through and rank those according to, uh, let's just say, boiling points. Right, so which of those compounds has the highest boiling point? Which of those has the lowest boiling point? And yes, we did already ask this question, so it should some frame of references. So if we go boiling point, I'm going to go through and number them one through four. So we'll say one has the highest boiling point. And four has the lowest boiling point. Right. On top of which, to have a high boiling point or a low boiling point, depends on your perspective, for a high boiling point, what do we need? Strong forces. Right? To have a low boiling point, what do we need? Weak. You need weak forces. Well, our forces come from looking at multiple molecules, and all we've got is a single molecule of all of these, so we need something else to look for. So what do we look for? <coughs> the bonds. When do we have strong forces? Okay. When we're looking at ionic bonds would be our first attempt. So with that first, well, actually, let's skip to the weak forces. What bonds would we expect for our weak forces? Sorry, what type of bond would generate our weakest force? Nonpolar covalent. And there's that stupid nonpolar term again. Okay. So we could go through and look at this. Do our compounds match either of those bond descriptions? So I'm seeing some heads shaking yes. What matches? The nonpolar covalent bonds, that description absolutely matches only one of these compounds perfectly, the very last one. Okay. That one is only nonpolar covalent bonds, which means it will have the weakest forces, which then means lowest boiling point. It's four. Okay. So if we now push this to the extreme of going to our ionic bonds, our strongest forces, do we see any ionic bonds? No. no. Okay, so while ionic bonds is true, it's not true for this question. So we need to change our definition. What other bonds should we be looking for if we can't look for ionic bonds? Mm 
And we have to be careful again. There is a difference between bonds and forces. We are going to be looking for our covalent type bond, but what is classified as polar covalent. How do we know we have a polar covalent bond? Anything bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or a halogen. Not just fluorine, fluorines for hydrogen bonding. Okay, more specifically for hydrogen bonding. So any of those situations match. Okay. So does this help us? Look at our structures and all of those have polar covalent bonds. Okay, so let's take a step away from this. Do our polar covalent bonds subcategorize out into different types of forces? Yeah, we have which two forces? Dipole. Our dipole dipole and hydrogen bonding. Okay. What's the difference? The hydrogen is stronger. Hydrogen bonding is stronger. How do I know I have hydrogen bonding? We're really looking for that hydrogen bound not not bleh, one of those three. Okay. So now we can go back to our, our question. Does that help us? Yeah, one of those compounds or two of those compounds have hydrogen bonding, one does not. What does that mean? The, the one that does not is now going to be three. our second weakest, which will be three. Between the next two, this one gets a bit tricky to interpret. This is how I would envision doing this. We would look to the um, similarities between these. We have hydrogen bonding in both. Okay? Because I have hydrogen bonding in both, I'm going to ignore those options. Right? Because they're the same. I don't care about them. Now I look at this and I answer the same question I've been asking. Which of these is more or less, uh, or fits one of our categories. The one on the right is more polar. The one on the right has polar covalent bonds. The one on the left non is just nonpolar covalent. That means the one on the right needs to be higher than the one on the left. Okay. I've already established that both of these are the highest. Okay. So that means I can now say I've got one and two. I've done my melting points, or sorry, boiling points. Kind of makes sense. Okay. Next thing I want you to do, this will, this will be kind of a fun example. Okay. You see the answers all written up on the board. Everybody agree? Yeah. Now look at your work. Do they even approximate each other? As I walked around, what I saw was the structures good first step, and then I saw a sequence of numbers underneath it, okay. which in most cases was correct. So I, I give you credit for that. Good job. You got it correct. But now do 70 of these questions. By the time you hit that 70th question, if you've done all of this in your head, you're going loopy, and the odds that you get that 70th question right falls through the floor. So what you need to be able to do is Stop thinking in your head, particularly if you're going to review your notes after class. You review your notes after class, what do you see? The answer. Do you understand how you got to that answer? You have no clue, so it doesn't help you. What you need to be adding is how are we approaching this? What are the steps that we went through? That is going to be the useful information that you need to be reviewing. Okay. Right. Questions on that? We could go through and look at solubility in much the same way. Solubility gets a little bit trickier. With melting points and boiling points, it's solely the same compound. It's the same molecule. So we don't have to really think outside the box. We aren't comparing things. We're just looking at those individual compounds. When we move to solubility, it becomes trickier because solubility naturally implies two things. So what you would have to do is compare your structures to another standard. Well, if that standard is water, we're going to have one set of rules. If that standard is hexanes, do our set of rules change? Yeah, because we're now comparing to a different species. So if we went back to those exact same questions and said, okay, 
with those three again, rank based on solubility. So yeah, there you go, rank based on solubility. Thank you. We need to know what it's being soluble in. Okay? Just saying rank based on solubility doesn't give us a clue as to what we're ranking in. So we'd have to add some extra information. Because water is so boring, let's go ahead and say hexanes. Actually, I'm going to say hexane just so we don't get that question. Okay. Hexane, for those of you that aren't familiar with the nomenclature yet, we're looking at six carbons. Oh my gosh, that was a lot of carbons. and then all of those hydrogens. Jimmy, Christmas. 16. No, you're right, 14. I can't multiply. Okay. So, solubility. What's the information that we should immediately be writing down so that we don't have to keep this thought in our head? Like dissolves like. I'll accept the abbreviation, though I do appreciate your addition there. What was that addition? Like forces dissolve like forces. How do we determine what our forces are? Well, number one, you need to know what your forces are. What are your possible forces? London dispersion, hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, and ionic. That's it. Just those four forces. Now that we know what our four forces are, we could look to our structures, except how do we determine our forces? We'd have to look at a second molecule. We don't have that second molecule. We now have to look at the bonds within each of these molecules, look at those classifications, and then see how we would predict those to match out with our forces. So what type of bonds do we get in hexanes? Hexane, sorry. Said, I know I'm going back and forth, but nonpolar covalent for the bond, which then gets us to our force being London dispersion. Six carbons is too much for me to write out. I'm not writing out London dispersion. Okay. If we now go through and take a look at our other structures, what bonds do we see in that first compound? We've got polar covalent, which gives us what force? Dipole-dipole. Does that lead us to hydrogen bonding? No. No. Okay, so we're stuck at dipole-dipole. Uh, and actually, let's color code that, because I've been doing it. Our forces will be in red. Our bonds will be in purple. Next structure gives us polar covalent which then leads us to dipole-dipole. If we have dipole-dipole, do we have hydrogen bonding as a possibility? Yes. yes. We do because? Hydrogen hydrogen hydrogen. Okay, next one. Type of bonds. Polar covalent. Types of forces. Dipole-dipole, which then means look for hydrogen bonding. Next one. Nonpolar covalent, which gives us our LDF forces. So if I just asked, because I don't want to deal with the ranking again, if we just ask which of these is the most soluble, four, four that one. Man, there's something going wrong this week. I can't talk. Our last one becomes the most soluble. Let's take this just a step further. Which one's the least soluble? Our first approximation is most dissimilar forces. So it's going to be the least possible soluble. So our most dissimilar forces are our hydrogen bonding. So we're looking at one of the middle ones. Okay. I heard somebody over here adding in. Which one is the least soluble of those two? The third one is our least soluble because not only does it have the example of our hydrogen bonding, but it also has the example of another dipole-dipole. Okay. That dipole-dipole, further different from the rest of the structure, that one makes that one the least soluble. Kind of, sort of? 
We talked about some solvent terminology. We've already discussed my deep loathing of the terms polar and nonpolar. Okay, these are really coming back to the bond structures that make these. So if we add in some bond structure information to get a polar solvent, what's our bond structure? What bonds would we expect for a polar solvent? Polar covalent. For a nonpolar solvent? Nonpolar covalent. Okay. Where is that difference between polar solvent and nonpolar solvent? Because I can draw out a bunch of structures that are polar covalent bonds that are nonpolar solvents. For instance, carbon tetrachloride. I've got lots of polar covalent bonds, but the molecule is nonpolar. So we have to bring in our interpretation of shape into our overall structure for deciding how our bonds translate to the molecule. And in this case, those polar covalent bonds all counteract each other, giving the molecule a net zero dipole moment. With no dipole, it can't be polar. So that molecule gets classified as nonpolar. Just like with our solvents, what we have here is a spectrum between polar and nonpolar. And we've kind of arbitrarily said, oh, well, there's this real distinct line in between where it's, it's either polar or it's nonpolar. There's nothing in between. That's not true. We have this big gradation all the way through. Solvents can fall anywhere on that line. It can be more polar or it can be less polar. It could be a polar molecule or slightly polar molecule, but not polar enough for it to dissolve in water. Okay, so we could start to classify that as a nonpolar compound, even though the compound is polar. There's our issue with our definitions. Okay? So realize that we have the spectrum. Try and classify it as best you can, and you come up with your best guess. So when it comes to solubility and uh, boiling points and melting points, we don't give you gray area examples when you're trying to rank them. Okay? We give you very clear examples where you can at least come up with a solid explanation for why they differentiate. Solvents go a step further. Just like when we looked at our forces, and that's ultimately what we're saying here, we have polar forces and nonpolar forces. We can take this a step further and look at it as protic versus aprotic. This adds another layer of information on top of this. Protic sounds like proton. What is our proton? A little more detail than just hydrogen. It is H+. Plus. We're looking at that positive charge. Well, when do I get a positively charged hydrogen? When the electrons in the bond holding on to that hydrogen have been pulled away from it. So what we're looking at is really a hydrogen bonding solvent. How do we know it has a hydrogen bonding solvent? When we look at the compound, and the compound has number one, whoops, a polar covalent bond, number two, a dipole-dipole force, number three, hydrogen bound to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. All of those setups are all of those conditions set up, satisfied, we have that protic solvent. What does a protic mean? No. Not H plus. Right? It says nothing about whether the molecule is polar or not. It just says that we don't have a positive H plus. Positive H plus, that made sense. We don't have a positive hydrogen in it, okay, partial or otherwise, which means really it's just not hydrogen bonding. So if I take a look at two compounds, I'm going to pick ethane this time instead of hexanes. So ethane is two carbons. Classify that solvent for me. It is aprotic. Okay, well, that's all you're going to give me. I'll stick with that. Classify this compound for me, or this solvent. 
a product. So what you've just told me is that if I take these two solvents, I would expect them to interact the exact same in all systems. Uh, there's no hydrogen bonds to oxygen, so I don't quite know what that means. The one on the left is referred to as, anybody know the name? Acetone. The one on the, le on the right was our ethane. Okay. Anybody know anything about the solubility of acetone in water? Fair enough. Slightly more slightly. It actually has a very, very high water solubility. Okay, well, based on the definitions that you just supplied to me, these are both aprotic solvents. What would we predict their solubility in water would be? If we classified them both the exact same, their solubility should be exactly the same. Aprotic is not our full classification. What's our full classification? Aprotic polar aprotic, nonpolar. That's a pretty distinct difference. That extra information can now allow me to predict something more about its water solubility or how it's going to dissolve other compounds. Okay? So when we talk about our solvents, we'll usually use any of these four terms. Okay? The one exception, I can call a, a solvent nonpolar, and I don't have to mention anything about protic or aprotic. Why not? If it's nonpolar, it has to be aprotic. There is no choice, okay, which is why when you take a look at the definitions of how I've organized them, we have polar and nonpolar at extremes, and the protic and aprotic, protic definitely has to be polar. Aprotic is centered somewhere in the middle because aprotic can be both polar or nonpolar. Okay? Make sense? Yippee. Qu oh, sorry. Dang it. As I just deleted everything. What's your question? But if it was an ion. You'll notice that we don't talk about ionic uh, solvents very often. Any ideas why? What phase is a solvent? Liquid. What phase are most ionic compounds? Solids. So very rarely do we actually work with solvents that are ionic. <coughs> Remember my previous allusion to my un or research for masters? Guess what that research was based on for the solvent? An ionic liquid. Right. Typically, we don't use them in organic chemistry because to get the liquid ionic, what do we have to do? Or the ionic liquid. We'd have to add a lot of heat to get it to melt. Okay. So if we heat up our, our ionic compound, say salt, up to 900 degrees Celsius so it now melts, and I now might add my organic compound to it, what happens to the organic compound? It combusts. Okay. Well, that kind of defeats the port, point of my study. Okay, so there are some compounds, particularly ionic compounds, that if we change how they can pack and interact with each other, we can get them to a very special class of liquids known as room temperature ionic liquids, okay, or RTIL, if you really wanted to look at it that way. Okay, they have interesting properties. That was part of what my research was looking at. Okay, so very rarely do we see those. We won't see them in this class. All right, what can we do with these interactions? Well, we already started to allude to this. So let's do a couple discussions. Yeah, why not? Why does salt dissolve in water? Okay. So then it's ionic. So if I go through and take a look at salt, and I look at water, what force is salt going to give me? I'm going to say ionic because I don't want to write electrostatic, <laughs> but you're right. Water, dipole-dipole force, which then pushes to hydrogen bonding. All of the ones that we've looked at, we've had the exact same force. Are these the exact same force? No. So that's an interesting dilemma. They aren't the exact same force. What is the solubility here? Very, very, very soluble. So for that to happen, two things need to occur. One, I need to break the hydrogen bonding interactions between the water molecules. All of those forces need to, well, at least some of those forces need to be destroyed. Okay. The next thing I need to do is I need to break the interactions 
and the sodium chloride. I need to destroy those ionic interactions so that they can interact more appropriately with water. So if we go through and do that, and we look at the interaction, say, between a chloride ion and water, what atom should be closest to the chloride from water? Hydrogen. Why the hydrogen? It's partially positive. Why is that important? We're trying to neutralize the charge. Okay, so we want that positive to negative interaction. What do we want to call that interaction? So I actually like your description there. We could call it an ionic dipole. Okay, we can't strictly call it ionic because only one end of it is ionic, the other one's not. We can't really call it hydrogen bonding because one end's ionic. So it doesn't really fit in our exact references. So this is why that color wheel is helpful. We're not strictly ionic. We're not strictly hydrogen bonding. We are somewhere in between. All right, so since I liked your definition, we'll call it ionic dipole. Is that a weaker force or a stronger force than hydrogen bonding? <coughs> Should be stronger because we have that ion interaction. We're trying to neutralize that charge. So it should be stronger than the hydrogen bonding. So that's good. Water molecules will want to break away from each other to interact with a chloride so that we can generate a stronger interaction. Should that be weaker or stronger than the sodium chloride ionic bond? Weaker. Which then says, sodium chloride says, no, I'm not going to break these bonds because I'm going to make a weaker interaction. Okay? I want to minimize that charge as best as possible. So based on this, we would then say, what's the solubility of sodium chloride in water? Insoluble. So we've got a hole in our theory. Okay. Solvents are a little bit more complex than a single interaction. What we're actually looking at is a whole bunch of these water molecules coordinating around that chloride ion. So now, why does this help us out? Well, the sum total of all of those forces is now stronger than the single ionic force in the salt. Okay. This typically means that if we have an ionic compound, it is soluble in water because we can get a lot of water molecules to stick around that ion. But what if our structure, well, actually, before we do that, any questions on that? Yeah. Is an oxygen more electronegative than the chlorine? I don't understand what you mean. Would it want to retain the hydrogen more than the chlorine? Would pull the we are not the breaking a bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen. All we're showing is an attractive force between the hydrogen and the chlorine. Oxygen is taking the electrons away from the hydrogen, making that hydrogen positive, which can interact with the chlorine. That's it. But we're not making or breaking bonds. So don't push it to that extreme. So Chloride is solid. How do you get enough water around it to break it? So if we take uh, salt, just take a brick, perfect crystal of salt, and I drop it into water. Okay, it's going to take a little while to dissolve, right? Now let's take that same amount of salt, but I pulverize it, turn it into tiny, tiny little crystals, and okay, now I add it to water. Let's add one extra thing to this because I want to make sure all of those crystals interact with water as much as possible. I'm going to stir it. Which one takes longer to, to dissolve? The block. the block. Because the only place it can dissolve is the on the outside. Okay. So it's going to take time to get into the inside. And that time aspect we don't care about. All we're just saying is that it will eventually dissolve. Okay. If you have enough water. We do run into extremes as well. Okay, so let's push this. And don't flip out that I'm now about to draw a structure that makes no sense. But let's now push this where we've got that negative chlorine. And what I'm going to do is now attach this. What are those things? No. Each of those squiggly lines has a point at multiple places within it. Carbons. Carbons. Every one of those carbons has... Hydrogens off it. What type of bonds did I just draw in there? Um, a bunch of nonpolar bonds, which gives me London dispersion forces. Are those similar to water? No. no. 
So even though I have this ionic charge in the middle of it, if I surround it with enough dissimilar things from water, I can take that compound that was water-soluble and now make it something that is insoluble. In organic chemistry, most of the stuff that we work with is relatively small molecules. So if it's charged, it's soluble in water. Right? But if we moved into, say, biochemistry, there's a lot of charged stuff within our body. Okay? A lot. Pretty much everything. So why do we even have a corporal existence? Okay. That's because there's also a lot of non-charged stuff that kind of keeps the water out and prevents strict solubility all the way through. Right? And that's really where that secondary feature comes in. Kind of makes sense? What happens with oil? If we look at oil, we're just going to pick a simple example of just methane and water. What happens now? Uh, London dispersion. London dispersion and? We'll eventually push to our hydrogen bonding. And if we then try to just stop talking and just draw like crazy. What interaction would we expect between those two molecules? Okay. Let's just name it. There's going to be none. We can say dipole, dipole London dispersion, right? Just like we did with the last one. Right? And if we look at the solubility of these two compounds, what are they? Soluble, insoluble? Insoluble. insoluble. Well, why? If we just go through and pull the exact same arguments that we ran with the other system, wouldn't we suggest that this should work? The hydrogen bonding is on the stronger side of the spectrum. Our solvent has a stronger spectrum rela relationship than our solute-solvent interaction even if I try and jam a whole bunch more water molecules around it. I can't quite clear that balance. All right, so we get dissimilar forces. They end up not mixing with each other. So they seem like kind of counterintuitive examples or counter to what we've been talking about, but they do still kind of hold true. And you will notice that we do have to kind of make some stuff to overlap them. We have to do that when it comes to organic chemistry. It's one of the things that's kind of beautiful about it because we don't have to quantify with numbers. We can use the experiment to say, I don't care what your numbers say. This is the answer. Okay. How does soap help all this dissolve? Whoa, don't look at that picture. If we look at soap in a very crude drawing, we usually have a nonpolar covalent structure at one end, and we usually actually have an ionic structure at the other. Well, what does the ionic structure want to do with water? Attracts it. So it actually really likes water. So we can call it hydro... Attracts it? Hydro attracts it? Oh, I don't know. Is there only one L? Here, let's just do hydrophil. Where's the nonpolar end? hydrophobic. So this single molecule, on its own, we have questionable solubility. It's difficult to figure out how it interacts. But if I now throw in a whole bunch of these, all of the hydrophobic ends can interact with each other, all of the hydrophilic ends can interact with each other, and eventually they turn into something that we refer to as a micelle. Why does that help grease and oils dissolve? Well, the grease and oil that's now stuck to your hand, when we mix it with enough soap, the soap can actually grab onto it and then fill the outside of the grease with a water-soluble surface. So now when you stick your hands under the water, what happens? You can rinse it all away. This gets taken advantage of in biochem. We can look at liposomes, okay? a slightly larger scaled version of a micelle where the inside is water-soluble and the outside is water-soluble. We have a bilayer. If we scale this all the way up to an actual cell, you can equate that to a bilayer sheet. Well, a cell is really just a massive 
liposome, a massive liposome. It's so big that we effectively call this a bilayer sheet. It's those separations that allow us to do a lot of the things that we see in biochem. Okay? All based off of intermolecular forces that you talk about and learn in both gen chem and organic. Questions about our forces? Because this is now the mind-blowing part of the lecture. Right? Or you will want your mind blown at the end of this lecture. Okay, so atomic versus molecular. Really what we're concerned about is looking at the balance of electrons and where they exist. So this is now moving into chapter 3, just so you know. Okay. And we've got these shapes that we've talked about. In our lower left-hand corner, we've got a sphere, which represents what? The S orbitals. Okay. 1S, 2S, any of those S orbitals. Well, really, that orbital shape is something that we've uh, ascribed to the exact electron cloud. Right? So really what's happening is our electron's jumping like crazy that we can't actually really predict very well. We can predict something about its location but then have no idea where it's going. Or we can have an idea of where it's going but then have no idea where it's located. Right? So that comes out of the mathematics behind this, which you don't need to know, but what ends up happening from that is that we get this fancy little graph where our electrons now exist, somewhere within that energy level. 95% okay. of the time, it exists within the shape of that sphere, so we call our shape the sphere, and that's what we then tell you to memorize as you're associating with the S orbital. Okay. If you remember all those quantum numbers from Gen Chem, N, L, M sub L, M sub S, all of those numbers that we tell you to memorize are actually coming out of the quantum physics that describe how an electron moves. Right, which is stupidly impressive to watch someone solve it. Okay, you won't find anybody here that can solve it. Right, at least I would be really surprised. Okay, so what we want to do is kind of simplify that a little bit. Our electrons have both wave and particle aspects to them. Right, and that's one of the reasons why this becomes difficult to go through and solve these things. So what we can do is look at kind of a probability of where our electron can exist. And so that's what's shown above. Right at the very top there. As we get further from the nucleus, what happens to the probability of finding the electron? It goes down. So what we've got at that top is our probability curve, which results in a spherical shape. Okay? If we now push this to how our electrons move, well, they can move according to waves. And I've got two waves shown up there. Okay? So these are the two possible ways that our electron can potentially be moving for a 1s orbital. And this is going to become important, because if I take a 1s orbital from one atom and a 1s orbital from another atom, and I bring them near each other, eventually what happens to those electron clouds? They overlap. They overlap. Okay? It's that overlap that is of critical importance. If they overlap in such a way where the, their waves add on top of each other, we get constructive interference. That's a good thing, because they add together, and now we're saying we're putting more electron density in the center area. That's a good thing. What happens if they add in a destructive fashion? Right. We aren't even going to worry about repel or attract. We're just saying that if we bring them together to the proper distance where they can interact, if they overlap in a constructive fashion, electrons now exist between the nuclei. What happens if they add and they're in a deconstructive, deconstructive? destructive overlap? Okay, so if we said these were constructive, they're actually drawn in such a way where they were destructive. But if they were constructive, what ends up happening is our amplitude gets bigger. Okay. What if they were destructive? Amplitude is smaller. It's actually worse than smaller. Look at exactly how these two curves are set up. We have them perfectly aligned. That's positive. That one's negative at the exact same location. I take plus one and I add it to negative one. What happens? Zero. I look at the next amplitudes. Negative one, positive one. What happens? Zeros. Zeros. 
If I look at destructive interference, I get a flat line. Okay. Well, an electron moves according to a wave. So if I have a flat line, there's no electrons. So if I take these two orbitals, in one case, the electrons now exist. In the other case, the electrons don't exist. So what we want to do is try and come up with some way to pictorially describe this so we can visualize it a little bit better. And these waves are just not particularly fun to look at. So what we'll do is switch it up to a hydrogen molecule. And we're going to pick a hydrogen molecule because it's the absolute simplest that we can work with. And pretty much all of our theories are based off of a hydrogen atom. Okay? So a hydrogen molecule is made up of what? Hydrogen's a good guess. Just one hydrogen? Two hydrogens. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is take a look at what's known as our molecular orbital diagram. I'm going to look at the atom of one hydrogen on my left and the atom of the other hydrogen on the right. Okay, well, what's the atomic picture look like for a single hydrogen atom? How many electrons does it have? One. Where is that one electron? In a 1s orbital. So we could go through and say, well, we've got a 1s orbital. It's not very picturey, so let's come up with a picture. Yeah, picture is a word. What's a picture for a 1s orbital? Sphere. You get a circle. Deal with it. How about the other one? Another sphere. The exact same thing. Should it be higher or lower in energy? Why should it be the same? It's the same atom, right? So no difference. Here's our 1s orbital, and here's our sphere. So remember, each of these orbitals has a sign associated with it. It can either be positive or negative. Okay. The only way we find out what that sign is is we push it near another orbital and see how they interact. So what happens is I bring this 1s orbital near the other 1s orbital. Let's say they're both positive. Or they're both the same sign. Do their waves constructively interfere or deconstructively? <coughs> Should be constructive because they're both the same sign, which means what happens with the overlap? Should start to overlap, and we should see electrons between the two atoms because that's exactly where those electrons first overlap. Okay, so the next question is where do I draw that new interaction? Because what I'm now looking at is a molecular orbital. I'm looking at how these two atoms and their electron clouds interact with each other. Should that molecular orbital be lower in energy or higher than in energy? Why should it be lower in energy? Everything's striving for lower energy. So if we just think of this in a pseudo-logical fashion, if I have two atoms... And a bond always goes to a higher energy. Would I ever form bonds? No. no. Well, do we exist as more than a single atom? Yeah. yeah. So what does that mean? Our bond should be lower in energy. So we can look at that molecular orbital as lower in energy. Okay. I'm going to add some nuclei to these. Where are nuclei located? Roughly our dead center. What happens if they add in a deconstructive fashion? Should that be higher in energy or lower in energy? Higher in energy, because that says we don't actually form the bond. Those molecules go back. Okay, so we can draw that deconstructive form up here. Now let's add our pictures over the top of these. If it's constructive, what happens? Uh, no, 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 I lied, I lied, I lied. Deconstructive. I think deconstructive is a little bit easier. So what we're looking at is as we bring these two things close to each other, what we're ultimately talking about, since I already filled up a lot of it, upper left-hand corner, we're looking at what happens where our two diagrams overlap. Okay, if it's deconstructive, what does that mean? Can the electrons exist there? No, 
So if I'm now going to add information to my picture, what's going to happen? What's going to be happening right through the middle of those two atoms? I should find no electrons, which means I have no bond, empty space. <coughs> you notice I still have an orbital for where the electrons can exist, because when those two atoms overlap, does the extreme left side of the left atom interact? No, it's only our right side. Okay? And it's not everything on the right side. It's only part of it. Because if it completely overlaps, we'd start to run into some other issues. Okay. What happens in the constructive interference? They should overlap. Let's push it further. What happened to the wave function? It got bigger, which means there's a higher probability of finding the electrons between the atoms. Notice there's now a lot of electron density in the very center, and there's very little electron density on the outsides. I definitely probably pushed that to the extreme, but it's close enough. Okay. All we're trying to do is describe how can these orbitals possibly interact with each other. And we picked the absolute simplest example we could, because if we pick more complicated examples, it gets a lot more complicated. We don't want to deal with that. Okay? So typically what you'll see added on top of this is you almost always see some dotted lines going down, representing where those orbitals came from. Okay, where our molecular orbitals came from. In this case, they came from 1s orbitals. So we're tying, trying to tie that information together. Okay. And if we wanted to predict something about the bonding characteristics of this and decide, do we have a bond? Well, how many electrons does a hydrogen atom bring in? One. So there's one. There's one. What happens if I now bring two hydrogen atoms near each other? I form these molecular orbitals. Well, what exists in orbitals? Electrons. How many electrons did I bring into this? Where should I put those two electrons? I can't say 1s anymore because there is no 1s orbital. That's only for the atomic structure. Where are they? They're in that bottom situation. We haven't even talked about what it is, but they're down below. Is that lower in energy or higher in energy than where they started? Lower in energy. What does that mean? Bond. Simple as that. We now have a bond. What happens if I switch this up, say, you know what? I want to know if I sh should predict a bond for H2 with a negative 2 charge. What does that mean? How many electrons are now in this? Four. So I add two more electrons, one to each 1s orbital. Now what happens? Where do I put those other two electrons? In the upper situation. I didn't do a very good job drawing this, but your upper situation is always significantly higher in energy than your lower situation is lower in energy. What does that mean? The net result then puts the average energy for our molecule where? somewhere in the middle, above the energy of the atoms. Well, if the energy for our molecule is higher than our atoms, what do our atoms do? They don't bond. So now no bond occurs. So we can now use this to actually predict if we would expect to see a bond. And then we can then go into the experiments and try and set this up. Okay? So what we're doing is manipulating these things. So some other terms that come out of this. Right, let's take those s orbitals, which you said were spheres, right? Okay, and as I bring them together, right, we got our nice little picture. And okay, now I'm going to take those two spheres, and as I bring them together, I'm going to rotate one. Dun, 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 dun. Does it change my picture? No. What if I rotate it the other direction? Doesn't change the picture. So what we're talking about with that object is that if I rotate those orbitals, no change of overlap happens. Okay. Even once we form the bond, what happens if I start to rotate? The overlap stays constant. So that overlap we refer to as, what type of bond do we have? 
Single was what I was fishing for at first. Now you got to go harder. There's the other one. Sigma. All right, so we have a sigma bond. What do we refer to the top one as? It's not a double. Because it has the exact same symmetry. If we bring our top ones in, and if I rotate those orbitals, they still never overlap. Okay, so it has the same kind of orbital symmetry. So it is still a single bond-ish. It is still called sigma. But can I call it a sigma bond? No, because no, it's not a bond. So we could be really clever and call it sigma not a bond. Okay. The powers that be didn't like that term, and they referred to it instead as sigma star or anti-bond. Anti is fancier than non or not. Okay. But it means the exact same thing. So we have the sigma anti-bond, because okay. there's no bond happening. This is the basic pre premise for molecular orbital theory and for hybridization theory. The same general concept for both of them. It's how do these orbitals overlap to generate new orbitals. Once we have these new orbitals, what can we then do with them? Okay. So let's push this into hybridization theory now. Okay. If we take a look at the formula for methane, everybody should be super familiar with that. We draw our formula for methane. How many electron groups? Four. Four electron groups. What's its shape? We have tetrahedral. So if we're going to get lazy with our shape and not have to redraw it again, we just go through and say, oh, that's a wedge, and that one's a dash. That's really lazy, okay, but somewhat acceptable. That's our molecule. If we now translate this back to what we understand, what we've got are now electrons between these atoms. Well, where do electrons exist? Where do electrons exist, period? Always. An electron cloud, also known as an orbital. Well, I have atoms with orbitals. Those orbitals explain where the electrons are. So if I know where the electrons exist within an atom, can't I logically then say that I should know where the electrons exist within molecules? It should just be just transferring it straight across. Well, what's the bond angle between an X acid X, those two? What's the angle between those two? So if we overlay those appropriately, what's that angle? 90 degrees. 90 degrees. All right, well, what's the angle here? In our methane, 109.5. That's kind of problematic. My atomic orbitals say I should have a bond angle of 90 degrees. My molecule says it should be 109.5. Yeah, you might attempt a rounding error, but it, it's not that close. Right? We could push this even further to the absolute extreme. What's the bond angle between the s orbital and the p orbital? really a bond angle there to speak of. I mean, they're on top of each other. Okay. Well, why would that matter? Well, to make a bond, how many electrons do I need? Two. How many electrons can I fit in an orbital? Two. So if we run off of that assumption, four bonds, I need four orbitals, which means I need the S and all three Ps, and I can only fit one atom in each of those interactions. But the bond angles between those orbitals do not match what the shape represents. That's a really big dilemma. So what we ended up doing in less graceful terms is we took those four orbitals and said, well, I don't care what they look like in the atomic level, but I do know that when I get to the molecular level, all four of those bonds need to be exactly the same. And since I cannot create or destroy matter, I will take all four of my atomic orbitals and I will mash them all into one giant pile and then I will make some new ones. Here's my new orbitals, and these new orbitals will have the exact 
bond angles needed to generate the bond structure. That is hybridization theory, done very inelegantly. The elegant fashion goes back to, oh, I forgot, I had to draw it all up, our molecular orbital theory, where we now start to overlap an S orbital with a P orbital. What happens to the shape when an S orbital and a P orbital on the same atom overlap? Whoops, that's going backwards further. So if I take, there's my S, there's my P. Well, in a P orbital, you'll notice that they're almost always one's shaded and one's not. Why? Because a P orbital has two phases. Half of it is the positive phase. Half of it is the negative phase. So let's say that my S orbital is in the phase that's not colored in. What happens to the electron density right here? Do I have a lot of electrons there or very little? Okay. Do we have the same phase? Yes. So what happens when we have the same phase? Whoop. We get a lot of electron density. So our electron density gets really big. What happens on the other side? It gets really small. And the shape we end up generating, good thing I did blue because that overlays so beautifully, is something along those lines where one lobe is much larger than the other lobe. And it has to do with that constructive versus deconstructive overlap. That becomes helpful when we go through and try and generate our hybridization theory. Okay. Strictly, this goes all the way back to the Lacow model, linear combination of atomic orbitals. Everybody heard of that in 151, right? Everybody heard of molecular orbital theory in 151? Really? Some of you did? Oh, that's news. That section of the material seems to be removed from 151 now, although it's incredibly important. Okay. So what's happening? Well, what we do is we take a look at our structure and we decide how many new orbitals we need or how many orbitals we need. And based off of that orbitals, we generate new orbitals. So for the sake of methane, what happened? We look at methane and we say, how many orbitals do I need? I need four orbitals. Okay, those four orbitals all have to be exactly the same. So if I look at my atomic theory, do I have four orbitals that are all exactly the same? No. So what do I do? Scrap them. I take all four of my atomic orbitals, smash them all into one piece, and I generate four new orbitals. Those four new orbitals are shown at the very top. I forgot I was going to stepwise this so you didn't get inundated with all this data. We now have four new orbitals. All four of those orbitals, you'll notice, have what energy relative to each other? The same. Does that match what I need for my methane structure? Yeah. If they're all the same energy, then I can get the same bond angles, all that relationship coming out of this. What happens if I switch this up to whoops, boron? How many electron groups are now around boron? Three. three. So I go back to my atomic orbitals and say, do I have three orbitals that are all the same? Sort of tricky. My p orbitals, I do have three p orbitals that are all the same. But what's the bond angle in BH3? With three electron groups, our bond angle is 120. What's the bond angle between our p orbitals? 90. Can I use just my p orbitals? No, it doesn't reflect the proper bond angle. So what do I do? I need three electron groups or three new orbitals, but I can't destroy orbitals and I can't create orbitals. So I'm going to go back to my atomic orbitals and I'm going to take the s orbital. There's one. Then what else am I going to do? I'll take two p orbitals. I'll take those three out, mash them around, and make some new orbitals. Boom. There's my new orbitals. So there's my three new orbitals that are all exactly the same energy. How do you know that? They're all on the same line, roughly. I had to eyeball it. All right. What happens if we move to yet another structure, which I can't think all that great on my feet. 
So yeah, let's just do something like this. How many electron groups around the magnesium? Two, which means I need two orbitals. Do I have two atomic orbitals that are exactly the same as each other? Could again attempt the P, but what's the bond angle on our P orbitals? 90 degrees. Does that match the 180 that I need for the magnesium bromide? No. So again, I'm going to pull my S orbital and my P orbital. So I now have two. Pull those out, mash them together like clay, and generate two new orbitals, and they will magically have the exact same <coughs> geometry that I need. Right. That's how I now have that new orbital. Yes, it is strange. Okay. And it is based very heavily in the mathematics behind this, okay, which I don't even want to touch. Okay, you don't want me to touch it either. It's a bad idea. Okay, it's contagious. Okay. <laughs> so what's happening in each of these cases, we generate these new orbitals depending on how many we need to satisfy our electron geometry. Okay, that's all that's happening with our hybridization. So with our methane structure, we needed four new orbitals. So what orbitals did I use? The S and all three P orbitals. There's four orbitals, that I, atomic orbitals, and I can generate four new <coughs> molecular orbitals. Being the super creative people that we've been, as we saw already with naming our forces, what do we want to name these new orbitals? Anything would have been better than SP3. But that's what we called it. Why did we call it sp3? Because we used three p orbitals and the s orbital to make those how many new orbitals? Four. Four. Right? And that's what's happening in our kind of magic little area. We're mixing those orbitals. Since I've mixed those orbitals in, that's the name that I give those new orbitals because those are the pieces that went into the new orbital. Right? You don't, so the amount there is only to specify how many each of them there are. So, because I've noticed a lot of students go through and say, well, SP3, I've got three of them. No, if you used an S and three Ps, you have four. There are four SP3 orbitals. So the term SP3 has a couple different meanings. The primary meaning that you need to be focused with is it is a new orbital. <coughs> that new orbital, there are four of them. If I move to an sp2 type orbital, that is the name given to the mix of orbitals that generates three equivalent orbitals. So you never have four sp2 orbitals? I could never have four sp2 orbitals because then I've ended with more molecular orbitals than I put in to begin with. Okay, it's our conservation of matter. 30, right? 1230? Oh. Okay. In the sp3, if we take a look at that upper situation, you at least somewhat okay with looking at the sp3s, the new molecular orbitals. I'm going to take that as a yes. We move to the sp2. There's our three new sp2 orbitals. Is that all I have drawn there? Why do I have that p orbital left over? I didn't use it in the hybridization, but I cannot destroy it. It is still present. All right. Should it be higher or lower in energy than my sp2s? Why should it be higher in energy? Nothing to do with bonding. Which is lower in energy, an s orbital or a p orbital? S orbital, which should be lower in energy, an SP hybridized orbital or a P orbital? The hybridized orbital. Why does the hybridized orbital always have to be lower in energy than the P? Because it has S in it. That S orbital is naturally lower in energy. What we're looking at is pretty much an average of our higher energy with our lower energy when we generate our hybridized states. That becomes helpful if we want to predict something about the reactivity of electrons. If we have an electron in a p orbital, that's actually a pretty high energy state, which means those electrons become more reactive than electrons located in an sp 
hybridized orbital. All right, which brings up another question. Uh, no, it doesn't. Not yet. All right. When we move to the SP hybridized system, we've only used one S and one P. What's left over? Two P orbitals. So you'll notice that those P orbitals are also left over. It's those leftover p orbitals that are going to allow us to do multiple bonds, which I'm hoping is here. Well, almost in a second. So the number of orbitals in your hybrid structure will equal the number of sigma bonds, because those are the ones that are going to involve direct overlap of orbitals. All right, so that can be helpful. The number of orbitals in your hybrid have to equal the number of sigma bonds in your structure. Um, with the leftover p orbitals, does it always have to be the p, y, and z, or? P, y, the y, z, x, all of that is just a frame of reference, okay? It ultimately does not matter. Uh, if we typically look at two atoms coming in near each other, when I bring those two atoms near each other, what axis am I moving on? We're talking about it in class. Most people call it the x, okay? So if I'm bringing two atoms near each other, the first p orbital that's going to interact would be the... X. So what would be left over? The Y or the Zs. All right, so that's why I left the Y and the Z unhybridized. Um, let's jump to the CO2. Wow, I really did not get through all the stuff I wanted to. Let's take a look at CO2. We look at our Lewis structure, which you guys should be able to draw pretty quickly and hopefully a little bit nicer than I just do to that C. should end up with this structure after all that work. And if we want to look at our molecular orbitals for this, okay, how many uh, sigma bonds do we have around the carbon? Okay. We'll reevaluate that in a second. How many electron groups do we have around the carbon? Two. Two, Two electron groups means we need two direct overlaps, sigma bonds. So I need two orbitals. So I will go through in my hybridization, I'm going to take the S and the P, and I'm going to generate my new hybrid. There's my new hybrid orbitals, and I'm going to leave two P orbitals unhybridized. All right, so there's my carbon structure. So the hybridization of that center carbon becomes SP hybridized. What happens with my oxygen? How many electron groups are around it? Three. Three electron groups, which means? Um, two S, P, P <clears throat> two. To form a bond, I need to have an orbital. Well, as we just discussed, we only have one orbital in between those two. I've got one from my uh, carbon and one from my oxygen. My carbon one is an SP. My oxygen one is an sp2. When those two orbitals overlap, we now have one molecular orbital. How many electrons can I fit in a molecular orbital? Two. How many lines are drawn between the carbon and the oxygen? Two, which represents? Four electrons. Our molecular orbital just explains the location of two electrons. What happened? Okay. If we take a look at our carbon, we have left over two p orbitals. If we took a look at our oxygen, what would be left over on our oxygen? One p orbital. If I draw those orbitals now over the top of this structure, and we'll assume they're the py's, there's the p orbital for my carbon. There's the p orbital for my oxygen. There is a gap there, but this is the funny thing about electrons. What can electrons do? They can jump through walls. As long as we're in phase, those electrons can jump back and forth. And what we end up seeing in our atomic spectrum is those two p orbitals. In our molecular spectrum, we would see something along these lines. 
What is special about this? What do I have down at the bottom? A bond. What do I have at the top? Not a bond. That's nice. <laughs> Call it an anti-bond. What makes this even more interesting? Those two p orbitals, and we will pick up with this on whatever it is Monday. Those two p orbitals suggest are my forearms. Okay. For them to interact, they have to be in the same plane. Everybody agree? They're in the same plane. What happens if I now rotate? They're not in the same plane. What is that going to do to the energy? Change it drastically. This type of bond overlap is an indirect overlap. There is a node in between. Our electrons are trying to jump back and forth. As soon as I rotate out of that, do I have any overlap? No. No. So when it comes to a pi bond, what does that say about the ability to rotate about this bond? I cannot rotate. Whereas our single bond could freely rotate. This bond is referred to as a pi bond. It's okay to pack it up because we are done. Or not, that's fine. It's typically referred to as a pi bond. The Greek letter pi represents what letter in our alphabet? P. What orbital was used to make these? P orbitals. Why do we refer to them as pi bonds? Because what we're looking at is P orbitals that were not hybridized interacting with each other. Pretty cool.